Greetings in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Easter at Sharonville United Methodist Church, Easter 2020. My name is Pastor Doug Damron, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this celebration of Christ's resurrection. Especially if you're a guest, a first time guest, thanks for tuning in to this virtual service. We hope that you find this service to be inspiring. And soon, very soon, when it's safe for us to gather again, you may find a place in this Christian community, loved just as you are. Sarah Potts now comes with, uh, to lead us in the call to worship and our opening hymn. Good morning, church. Happy Easter to you. Won't you please join me in our call to worship? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now won't you join me in joyful praise singing our opening hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. co-director of children's ministries at Sharonville United Methodist Church and today I'm here to talk to you about Easter and I have a helper with me hi. say hi Kira hi Kira's gonna be my helper as we retell the Easter story using an object called a tea bag a tea bag we have a basic everyday tea bag and we're gonna use it to tell the Easter story what's the first part of this tea bag Kira a label a label and a label tells you what's inside of it right this tells you that it's decaf tea 
Sometimes labels are like our names. I call you Kira, you call me mom. Sometimes Jesus got labels too, didn't he? He got named lots of different things. What do we call Jesus? What are some other words we talked about at Christmas time? A lot of words that we can call Jesus. Christ. Christ. Messiah. Messiah. We call him King of Kings, the Savior. When they put Jesus on the cross on Good Friday, they put a plaque at the top, a label at the top that said King of the Jews. But Jesus didn't need any labels, did he? He came down and took human form so he could be a servant to all of us. Remember when he cleaned the feet of his disciples? He washed their feet, each one of them. He wanted to be a servant to others to show God's love. So that's a label we want to keep in mind when we talk about Jesus. All right, what's the next part of the tea bag? A string. A string. And what does a string do? Well, a string usually attaches two things together. In this case, a string attached the label to the tea bag. But in life, we can become attached to a lot of things, can't we? Sometimes as kids, you get attached to your toys or your electronics. Even adults get attached to things. Sometimes adults get attached to their fancy cars or their nice homes or their power or money. All kinds of things we can get attached to. But when we talk about attachments, Jesus came down to help us focus on God and to not be attached to those things. So let's let, us, let the string remind us that our purpose, well, his purpose when he came down was for redemption, not for attachment. Okay, let's go to the next part of the tea bag. See that shiny metal thing at the top of the tea bag? Mm -hmm. What would you call that, Kira? Call him a staple. A staple. So I'm going to try to get it off of here. And this staple is going to remind us in the Easter story about how Jesus was attached to the cross. So remember, Good Friday, he went to the cross to be crucified, and they attached him with long metal nails through his hands and his feet, right? Not staples, but we'll let this staple and this metal remind us of that, that bad time. All right, so inside the tea bag, we have tea, don't we? And what's this tea look like here? I'm going to pour some of this tea out here. Looks like little, like, grain-like things. It does. It kind of, to me, it kind of looks like dirt, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The tea inside sometimes looks like dirt. And you know, this dirt reminds me of the sin in our lives. We have dirt in our life, don't we? And we can call it sin. And sometimes we have so much sin that it just kind of fills our life up, doesn't it? And this tea that's in here that looks like dirt can remind us, this pure glass of water, that when we get sin in our lives, sometimes muddies up our life. And we're not clean and pure, are we? And that's what we need Jesus for. So we're going to let the tea and this tea bag Remind us of our sin in our life and how Jesus came down with the promise that he would redeem us on the cross and die for our sins. So as we are left with this piece here, this is the tea bag, isn't it? This is the bag. It kind of doesn't look like a bag when we open it, does it? But it's the tea bag that's left. And I think in our Easter story, we should look at this tea bag standing up here, white and pure, to remind us that when Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday for us, he cleansed us of our sins, didn't he? Because he died, he redeemed us in the eyes of God so that someday we would be standing pure beside God in heaven. And that's the story of Jesus, isn't it? That if we could stand tall and pure someday, we could be just like Jesus. In fact, we could be a light unto the world for Jesus. What is this? A lighter. This is a lighter. So sometimes we have to be a light, and we have to remember that we have that light of Jesus inside of us. So let's light this, and let's remember that we need to be that light of Jesus, and that when we are filled with that light, just like Jesus was, we can rise up and be just like Jesus as he went to heaven to be at the hand of God, and that someday when we are redeemed, we will also rise up. The story is about resurrection on Easter Sunday, isn't it? On Sunday, the story got better. It was pretty bad on Friday night during the crucifixion, but on Sunday, we opened the tomb and there was nothing there because like our tea bag, he had risen to heaven to be with God. So next time we have some tea in the morning, I want us to think of the Easter story and think about the resurrection of God on that Easter Sunday. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for loving us so that you sent your son to die for us. We are so, so thankful for the Easter story that doesn't end in death, but ends in a risen Lord. We are so thankful that you brought us here today, and we hope that you go with us this week out into the world and bring us back safely next Sunday so we can worship again in this space. In your name we pray. Good morning, Amen. Sharonville United Methodist Church. Happy Easter. I hear the Savior say, my strength in need is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Let us pray. On this Easter Sunday, the highest and holiest for Christian people, we bow before you, God of life, in utter humility, considering the mystery and majesty of Jesus Christ's triumphant resurrection. For some of us, this may be our first Easter, new to the faith. For others of us, it may be our 70th or 80th. We've walked this path before. But for all of us, this Easter does feel so very different, O oh God. We feel the disequilibrium of the first disciples in the garden on, on the first Easter morning. The disciples, they had so many questions, we have ours. The disciples displayed a variety of emotions, including um, doubt. And we have a, a variety of emotions to express as we open our authentic selves to you. And like the first disciples, we do gather, we do pray, yearning for hope. Hope believing that now that because Jesus Christ lives, life triumphs over death, grace over sin, hope over despair. Oh God, we pray that you continue to extend to us in this hour your love by providing for our daily bread, 
your protection by extending to us the healing presence of Jesus Christ. And we pray on this Easter that you may fill us anew with your spirit so that we may continue our ministry as ambassadors of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name, in his spirit, for his glory we pray. The prayer that the risen Christ teaches the church at this hour to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey there, church. So glad to be back with you again today as we praise the Lord on this Resurrection Sunday. I hope you'll join me as we sing together, lifting up and praise our risen Lord, the one and only who gave so much for us through the miracle of rising from the dead. We know that he can take us through any times that we have, good, bad, ugly, whatever they are. We know we have a risen and mighty Lord there to save each and every one of us. Won't you join me again as we worship the Lord, wherever you are, whatever place you're in right now, as you're watching and worshiping the Lord, let's join together. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. for continuing to support the church during this time. And we invite you to continue to do so, whether that's sending in your contributions, sharing them with, on our Church Center app, 
or just going to our website, SharonvilleUMC.org, and pressing the give button. It's so important for us to continue to reach out to the world that surrounds us so that they too can know about the great and mighty power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You were the word at the beginning. name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus people said. Amen. Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they had taken the Lord out of the tomb and don't and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the and other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw that the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They were asking her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples of the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he said these things to her. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts as we celebrate this high and holy day, Easter, prove to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and salvation. Amen. I've had the privilege of serving as a pastor for 22 years. That means a lot of Easter's and a lot of Easter sermons. I don't remember all those Easter Sundays, and I don't remember all the Easter sermons, uh, but I think this year, Easter 2020, will be one that we will never forget as we gratefully thank God for bringing us together, even in this unique way, as God seeks to fill our lives with hope again. We'll never forget Easter 2020. And for me, I will never forget my first Sunday as a pastor, the first time I led an Easter sermon or service, the first time I ever preached an Easter sermon. It was 1996, and I had been serving about nine months as the student pastor of a rural congregation called Marathon United Methodist Church in Marathon, Ohio. Anybody know where Marathon is? Well, if you've ever taken the trip from Cincinnati to Hillsboro on Route 50, if you didn't blink, you went through Marathon. Marathon, back in the mid-90s, had four institutions in this small town. The, the sign outside the village said Marathon, population 400, and believe me, that was a liberal estimate. Only four institutions in that small town. There was the post office. The post office where you had to uh, uh, literally go to pick up your mail daily. And there you would encounter Postmaster Joyce. Joyce, the wife of the lay leader of Marathon Church. Along with picking up your mail, you picked up the daily gossip from town. Then next to the post office, there was the uh, one store, one small store, Dave's Grocery. Best fresh bologna, sliced bologna you ever tasted. But beyond that, there was only a few shelves of uh, dusty canned goods. Behind Dave's was uh, the only church in town, Marathon United Methodist. There since 1874, a small red uh, brick building, a small bell on top of the church, a gravel parking lot surrounding the building. 
And there was one more institution in town in the mid-90s. Country singer Garth Brooks in one of his songs uh, talks about a honky-tonk association. And if there was a honky-tonk association, and if they passed out awards for the, uh, the most unique um, names of honky-tonks, certainly marathons would be in the running. The notorious honky-tonk. It was called Just One More. That was a little bit of marathon. And I was excited in 1996 uh, to lead my first Easter service as a student pastor and to preach my first Easter sermon. I remember I borrowed a white robe from the seminary chapel. I worked hard on the sermon, but then, but then something went horribly wrong, something that I will never forget. On our way, on my way from the uh, Sunday school wing into the small sanctuary, I was walking behind two teenage girls. Uh, one of them, Rachel, she turned to her friend uh, Brandy and she said this. She articulated this out loud, heading into Easter service. She said, you know, I just don't understand. What's the big deal about Easter? And Brandy looked at her and shrugged her shoulders. They've been raised in the church. They've been confirmed. They're part of the youth group. We're heading in to celebrate High and Holy Easter, and they ask, what's the big deal about Easter? Easter is the big deal. Easter is the deal itself. And then at that moment, as a young rookie pastor, I made a decision. A, de a decision that... Uh, I would regret. I decided uh, at the beginning of the service, it was being led by the lay leader and by some musicians. So when I took my seat behind the pulpit, I decided to rearrange the sermon a little bit. Maybe I would shorten this and I would add content, all, all with the hope of being able to share with Rachel and Brandy, and I'm sure there have been other people that uh, maybe had that question. What's the big deal about Easter? I would take this opportunity to teach. If you're a fan of football, you've heard the term calling an audible. Calling an audible. What's that? Well, the quarterback in the huddle calls the play or the coach's play. And then a seasoned quarterback, keyword seasoned. If the quarterback steps up to the line right before the ball is snapped and sees a defensive scheme um, that looks strange or an opportunity, the quarterback can call an audible. Uh, the quarterback can change the play right there at the line of scrimmage. Well, that's what I did with my Easter sermon. But I was far from seasoned. I had one class in preaching and only nine months of preaching myself. And judging upon my uh, revised at the last moment Easter sermon, Judging, looking at uh, both of these girls doodling on the back of offering envelopes. These were the days before cell phones. Obviously, I wasn't making a breakthrough. I wasn't convincing them of the big deal of Easter. So, I'll never forget that first Easter as a pastor. And I've run through this scenario a number of times, and I wonder... Uh, what made me or what uh, tempted me to make that very bad call uh, my first Easter as a preacher? Well, I was 26 years old. And I think at that point in my life, in my, in my faith development, questions like, what's the big deal about Easter? I found that to be very frightening. Questions, especially questions asked on a holy day like Easter. For me, that was a sign of doubt, weakening faith. But you know, over time, walking with the Lord, serving as a, a pastor over these years, and immersing myself in Scripture, I've come to a different point when it comes to matters of questions, even big questions and risky questions. Questions are not a sign of a lack of faith.
Matter of fact, it's an invitation to grow, growing and greater understanding of our shared faith. And I've also come to know this. The God that we have come to encounter on this Easter is bigger than all of our questions. And the scriptures, the scriptures that we love, they invite, they inv evoke question after question. Rachel asked a pretty big and bold question. What's the big deal about Easter? She's not the only person who has asked questions. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth asked some risky questions. This Thursday, we remember, it was Monday Thursday, last meal with Jesus and his friends. Jesus on his knees washing their feet. And at the end of the evening, Jesus retiring to the garden in order to pray, pray alone. He looks to heaven and blood like sweat begins to um, form on his head as he looks to heaven and he asks a question. God, Father, is it is possible that I may be spared this cup, that I may be spared this suffering? Jesus wasn't afraid to end a prayer with a question mark. Questions. Our God is big enough for questions. Scripture invites and evokes questions. And back to Jesus this Friday as we remember his sacrificial death for you and me and the world at the moment of most pain, moment of most uh, abandonment. Jesus, the Son of God, from the cross would look up and he would ask a question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Questions are not a sign of a lack of faith. Questions, scripture evoking questions. This is it an invitation for us to grow in our faith, to grow closer to God in our understanding of, of our shared faith? And when it comes to Easter and the accounts of what happened on this morning in a garden outside of Jerusalem, all four writers of the Gospels, all of them, all of them invite questions. All of them have commonalities in, in their accounts. The tomb was empty, Jesus Christ was alive, and all of them, all of them invite questions as they share their unique perspective of what happened in this garden, how God moved. Mark, for example, in his gospel, uh, the account of Easter ends with the women fleeing from the tomb in fear, telling no one. That evokes a question. How do we know about Easter? If that's how um, uh, the response of those who first beheld the empty tomb. And there's Luke's account. In Luke's account, we find Peter. Peter in the upper room, he learns that the, there's a report of an empty tomb. He makes his way, strolls to the garden, he steps into the tomb, he conducts his own CSI investigation, takes some notes, takes some pictures, scratches his head, shrugs his shoulders, and goes home for Easter brunch, ready to pick up the case the next day. A lot of questions about uh, uh, the first disciple's response. But of the evangelists, those who share this incredible account of Christ's resurrection, of all of them, John evokes the most questions. In the account we heard today, I count no less than four questions. The angels ask Mary Magdalene, why are you weeping? Mary Magdalene wants to know, where have they placed him? Jesus to Mary Magdalene, again, why are you weeping? And then one really big whopper of a question. The first appearance of Jesus from the tomb. His first appearance is, he appears as a gardener. Jesus, his first appearance alive. He's wearing bibs. And he's got a leaning on a shovel. And he has his sleeves rolled up, ready to get to work as a gardener. What? 
What's, what's that all about? Well, that's been a conversation that's been ongoing in the church and continuing at this hour. But here's one possibility. Here's one possibility. When you look at the whole story of God revealed in Scripture, you could frame it this way in two parts. There's the Old Testament. This was God's presence and work before Christ. And then there was the New Testament. You turn from Malachi to Matthew. And then God's work with the coming of Christ and continuing now. That's one way to frame the story. God's great story revealed in Scripture. But there's another way it could be framed. It could be framed with three gardens. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates Eden. A beautiful, lush garden. God's intention. A garden of paradise where the divine and human would enjoy an, an uninterrupted relationship. And God and humanity would be at one with creation. But we know that in this garden there was a tree. A tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve bit that fruit. And you and me have bit it as well. And there's been a price. A price with this disobedience. Hellish havoc has been unleashed. That's the first garden. The beginning of, this, of God's story revealed in Scripture. But did you know at the end? At the end of Revelation, the end of the story... There's also a garden, a garden in a park-like setting in the New Jerusalem, a crystal stream and a great tree of life, a tree of life, the leaves of which will prove to be to, to form the balm of healing, healing of peoples, communities, healing for the nations themselves. And under the shade of this great tree, in the new heaven and in the new earth, all of us find shelter. We find respite in the shade. No more crying there. No more disease there. No more despair there. No more war. No more death. We know that in the end, God's going to get what God wants. God wanted a garden of perfect harmony with God's children and creation. And that's the end of the story. But there's one more garden. And that's the garden we're standing in at this moment as we give ourselves to John's telling of the Easter account. A pivotal garden. A garden where Christ rises and appears as a gardener. In this uh, garden, this Easter garden, everything changes. We turn now away from Eden and we turn our face toward that new garden in the new Jerusalem. Christ makes appearance as a gardener, gardener perhaps as a sign, a sign to help us see the presence of the living Jesus right here and right now. Christ appears Wherever there is the promotion of life, Christ is present, no longer limited by one space, one time, one physical body. He is now the living Christ. Wherever we see the promotion of peace, the work of justice, the extending of healing, and of course, the offering of grace, grace upon grace for a fresh start, we are beholding the presence of the living Christ, freed from death, freed from that garden doom. Jesus appearing as a gardener gives us a sense of what he is, who he is and what he is about. His hands are now in the soil, nurturing the sapling of that which will be the tree of life, the end of history, God's intention. Mary's first look at Christ, she saw a gardener. I wonder in this hour, knowing that wherever we see the promotion of life and healing and health and reconciliation, maybe with eyes of faith this Easter, this is how we are seeing the gardener, Jesus Christ, nurturing that which will be 
the tree of life. Final question for this Easter Sunday. If you think about it, the church is really a gardening club. Christ alive, Christ at work, comes about through you and me, his hands and feet. If you have made profession in Jesus Christ, if you have passed through these waters of grace... You have been given the very same spirit that lifted Christ from the dead. You have been given his very presence. You've been given gifts so that you can join the work of gardening, helping this world to become what God has intended from the beginning, moving along with Christ to move us to that glorious future, which is the new heaven and the new earth. So question this question on Easter 2020 is, do you have your hands in the soil? Are you doing your part to help nurture that which will be the tree of life? God's intention for all of us to find shelter under that blessed tree. Happy Easter. Amen. Hello again. I know I have really been missing our chancel choir, um, and I know many of you are too. So we wanted to give you a song from them this morning, but I promise we are not disobeying social distancing rules. We just picked up our anthem from last year. So please enjoy our choir from SUMC singing Christ is Risen, Alleluia, from last year's Easter service.
song, singing out loud our final hymn together, He Lives. <laughs> Friends, before the benediction, I'm going to invite you back next week. We're starting a new series, While We're Apart, Lessons and Letters from Prisoner Paul. So much of Paul's ministry happened while he was in isolation as a prisoner. He has much to teach us. Come back and join us as we seek not only to survive, but even begin to thrive as we continue to move together through this uh, season of having to be apart for the health of everyone. And now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his glorious countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people who join the great gardener in forwarding forwarding the kingdom of God, nurturing that which is the tree of life, say, amen.